Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 12 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and as always, a funky mix of dope music. All right, so to get us started, here are this week's top news highlights. Tokyo 2020 organizers aim for a smaller, simpler, better, faster, stronger Summer Olympics. Japan plans to let in 250 foreigners daily under eased travel curbs. Simeon Scramble 70 monkeys escape Chiba Zoo via suspicious hole in fence. This week in Japan. All right, so Tokyo 2020 organizers aim for a smaller, simpler, better, faster, stronger Summer Olympics. French newswire AFP has reported that Olympic organizers are looking at ways of simplifying the postponed Tokyo 2021 Olympic Games. In an exclusive interview with AFP, International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach said that officials were studying 200 proposals to simplify the Games. President Bach stated that, the impact is huge, as you can imagine. It never happened before that we had to organize a postponed Olympic Games. So we are looking, together with our Japanese partners and friends, on ways how we can simplify the organization of the Games, how we can reduce the complexity, and how we can save costs for these postponed Games. The 2020 Tokyo Olympics were supposed to begin on July 24th of this year, but in March, they became the first games outside of war times to be postponed. They are now scheduled to start on July 23rd, 2021. Tokyo Organizing Committee President Yoshiro Mori said that the Olympic Games used to be conducted in an extravagant grand splendor, but in the face of COVID, would that kind of games be accepted? The world has changed. Socially, economically, and medically, we are going to replan and reposition the game's organization. Christoph Duby, the IOC's sports director, said that in order to simplify the games, officials were looking at service levels and the need for goods, operations, and venue management. From our previous games, we've seen that sometimes we overplan and underconsume. We will not let any stone unturned. The result will be positive. Spoken like a true Doobie brother. However, some officials have expressed concerns that the Olympics cannot take place even in July next year if the virus is still active. In the same interview, Bach denied the IOC had set a deadline for a decision on whether the Games could go ahead. There is no timeline and no deadline for this. If we have learned something during this pandemic and during this crisis, it is that the issues evolve by the day, sometimes by the hour. Therefore, we cannot set a deadline now to say the conditions at this point in time have been as such. We are working on the success of these Olympic Games and we are concentrated on July next year together with Japan. We will stick to our principle that these games will be organized in a safe environment for all the participants. In order to accurately assess uh, these games, we've given the plan to the uh, secretary to the director of the vice president of the IOC Committee Foundation for Sports and Wellness. And after their plan is finished, then we'll pass that on to the uh, receiving ambassador for sports and technology uh, in Germany. And <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, no. <laughs> well, you know, so uh, also the IOC has said uh, right after this development that right now, Canceling the games is not on the table. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. But they said uh, that we're not thinking about it right now. Okay. They're not thinking about it. Yes. It's not on the table now, but it might be like, whoop. Oh, now it's on the table. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess we should have set a deadline. <laughs> and so that there are some rumors that, you know, what is it by this October or next March? I think this October is one deadline and then next March is another deadline. Mm. But, uh, I don't know. They said that the deadline's not a deadline. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's, a, it's just a line. It might be dead. It might be alive. But uh, 
There's no line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, we'll probably talk about it later in the podcast, but the, I think the real determining factor here is going to be when are they going to open up travel, right? Uh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, honestly, by next year, I feel like there's going to be some kind of gains, but I think that this does suggest that they are seriously considering what kind of games. Mm. And, I mean, obviously, it's going to be scaled down, and it might be spectacularless. I mean, it is. that's a big question. I Live think that, on Zoom. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> Usain Bull, we can see you run really fast, but you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, Japan plans to let in 250 foreigners daily under eased travel curbs. Or 250 gaijins a day to keep the corona away. Good one. Kyoto has reported that Japan plans to ease its coronavirus travel restrictions by letting in up to around 250 foreign travelers per day from Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and Vietnam government sources said Thursday. The quota, which Japan aims to introduce this summer, will initially apply to business people, sources said, adding that the government task force on the virus response is expected to finalize their plan soon. Japan currently has an entry ban in place for 111 countries and regions, with foreign travelers who have been to any of these areas within the last two weeks being turned away. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe told a parliamentary committee that we will continue to carefully consider ways to partially resume international travel in stages while taking care to prevent infections from spreading. Foreign travelers who come to Japan under the quota will be required to hand in negative results from a PCR test taken before their departure and another one taken when they land in Japan. In true Japanese fashion, uh, visitors who come in over the quota will have to wait in a long line. They, they love those lines. <laughs> I, I wonder what they're going to do, how they're going to enforce this quota, I mean. Mm, yeah, especially during peak travel season. And Oh, you're number 251. Sorry. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs> they will also need to submit an itinerary detailing the hotel they are staying at and places they intend to visit and refrain from using public transportation, the sources said. They may be asked to keep GPS data on their smartphone to make it easier to conduct contact tracing in the event they are found to be infected. So business people such as executives and engineers will be given priority with students and then tourists set to follow later. The government is also considering setting up stations to conduct these PCR tests on people leaving Japan as some countries have begun opening their borders to those who provide negative results. According to the Japan Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 181 countries and regions have imposed travel restrictions of some kind on Japan, including Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, and Vietnam. So it goes both ways. So the easing of these travel restrictions, of course, is expected to be mutual. So right now, discussions are being held with these countries on how to go about doing this without risking further spread of COVID. They're also trying to work details such as how many from each country will be lit in and how freely they will be allowed to move once at their destination. Japan chose the four countries for the scheme because they have the outbreak under control and due to their strong economic ties with Japan. Depending on the situation, the government will consider expanding the list later to other countries including China, South Korea, and the United States. So, you know, Parker, for me and you being Americans here and for a lot of our colleagues uh, in the U.S. and in Japan, this is uh, quite a buzzkill. That's right. You know, so actually for those stuck outside of Japan, of which there are many, there is a bit of news. Uh, it looks like the Immigration Service Agency has recently posted to its official website a list of special cases of long-term foreign residents being accepted to re-enter into Japan. Mm. Uh, as we've discussed previously, there are exceptions to the entry ban from people coming from the United States, and it's widely known that permanent residents and spouses of Japanese nationals are allowed to re-enter depending on the circumstances, but people who are holding other visas, such as business managers or other company employees, university professors, students, etc., 
uh, are not allowed to re-enter Japan even though they have a valid long-term visa. Mm -hmm. So this is news that the immigration agency will consider those who have a valid reason. And so they put these cases on the website, but actually uh, I just heard that the only way in order to get them to consider a special case is to buy a ticket to Japan, show up, and when you go to immigration, you got to bring your evidence and you got to have a good story that checks out and they'll think about it. So you're saying there's no formal process? Well, the formal process is that. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> Just it's roll not, the dice. Yeah, it's roll the dice. So mm -hmm. you have to come here, bring your documents, have your story in line, and they'll consider it. And mm -hmm. so apparently uh, you might think, well, what if immigration is closed? But of course it's open 24 hours a day, so. Mm-hmm. Yes, for uh, you know anyone in APAC, anyone who lives a borderless life, which there are quite a lot, especially here in Tokyo, uh, they may send their kids to school in the U.S., uh, but their residence is here in Tokyo. This is a very complex and frustrating situation. One even more uh, worrying thing that I've spoken with uh, about uh, two people in the healthcare industry is that they know there's different strands of the virus, right? So the strand that um, you and I are immune to or we've developed immunity to here in East Asia is most likely different from the strand in Europe, specifically Italy, and then the one in the United States now. So if you think about it, if we were to all of a sudden even be able to go back to the US, we are not immune to the strand in the US. And then on the other hand, those in the US are not immune to the one that we carry, right? So I think there's an even greater risk there. Uh, this may or may not be underpinning the slow move to reopen borders, but I think it is something to consider for anyone uh, thinking about travel within the next three months. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I just hope that we reach a solution sooner rather than later because a lot of people right now around the world are in limbo, not just Americans, obviously, but mm -hmm. uh, I think long-term residents, you know, people with a resident status, uh, if that resident status expires while they're out of the country, even though obviously there are extenuating circumstances, they have to reapply from zero. So yeah, yeah. it's uh, I think a lot of people are in a very potentially compromising situation, or at least a you know major pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So next up, Simeon Scramble: Seventy Monkeys Escape Chiba Zoo via Suspicious Hole in Fence. So Mainichi reports that seventy Japanese macaque monkeys were found to have escaped from a zoo in Futsu City, Chiba after a construction worker spotted a hole in the fence. The zoo's fence, which is 3 meters high and has a perimeter of 90 meters, was found with a hole cut out of it, apparently broken by an unknown human accomplice. A construction worker at Takagoyama Zoo, who discovered this monkey business, immediately reported the problem to the city government. The government-run facility has filed a report with the Futsu police station. According to the zoo's operator, the workmen thought something was amiss after seeing the macaques outside of their cage at around 7 a.m. on June 10th. He then went to go and check the fence. There, he found a suspicious hole measuring about 38 centimeters high and 30 centimeters wide. Fence forensics experts have concluded that a bladed object was used to make the opening. The zoo has no surveillance cameras covering the area. As of 8 p.m. the same day, there had yet to be any reports of damage caused by the escaped monkeys in the area. The city government is warning residents not to approach the animals, and box traps with food are being used to try and catch the macaques. If you encounter a group of these sly simians, do not try to put them in a barrel, even though doing that might be a lot of fun. <laughs> Chiba's Boys in Blue have made a public call to try and get leads on the criminal responsible for this dastardly deed. The usual suspects? Donkey Kong, Curious George, and Chim Chim are probably hiding in a music instrument box on a private plane by now. When I saw this on the news, I honestly thought, how do they know exactly 70 monkeys? Does that mean so there were 70 monkeys and they're all gone or there were like 85 monkeys and exactly 70, <laughs> 70 of them decided to escape? Not sure. 
just the the exactness of the number, right? Mm, mm, mm. If it were America, I think it'd just be like a bunch of monkeys escaped. <laughs> is it is it really so bad that there's a bunch of these monkeys uh, running around? Well, you know, in Nico, they, they just kind of hang out. And uh, there's also that place in, what, Nagano Prefecture where the monkeys go to like this onsen and just kind of <sighs> chill. Dude, yeah. Actually, I love watching videos of that. It's so relaxing. Yeah. The monkeys are just chilling out. And so, honestly, I mean, maybe the monkeys are smarter than we think they are. And they like kind of like human evolution. They figured out how to cut a hole in the fence yeah. in a perfect 30 by 38 centimeter <laughs> circle. And uh, they, they emancipated themselves. I mean, it's, it's possible, right? It sounds almost too easy. I mean, even if it was some animal rights activist, I mean, it's, it sounds like a really easy execution. Uh, just a small hole. And there's no security cameras. Wow. Wow. But... I mean, what kind of person would do this, though? I mean, it's like, I gotta free the monkeys! <laughs> <laughs> Some drunk animal rights activist, not sure. You know what, Aaron? I think uh, we, we have a new calling. We have to go around the country freeing the monkeys <laughs> <laughs> from their monkey oppressors. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it, it can be a little depressing seeing all the animals in the zoo sometimes, though, you know? I have a, a favorite park in Zushi at the top of this mountain and they have this little cage full of monkeys mm -hmm. and they you know you look at them you look at them and they look so much like humans I mean you can really kind of feel the evolution just looking at the monkeys mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they look at you like you know you want to let me out of this cage bro <laughs> come on yeah yeah I mean they your ancestors were like me help a monkey out same psychology all right, next up on the weird thing of the week, we're going to talk about the release of the PlayStation 5. Number five. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. The weird thing of the week. Oh, hell no! Okay. According to What Hi-Fi, the PlayStation has always offered more to the audiovisual world than just games. It has scored well with DVD playback, Blu-rays, and 4K streaming over the years. So, the PlayStation 5, now the fifth PlayStation in existence since the original launch in 1994, what will it have to offer at launch? Will it be 8K? Will it support, you know, some sort of new optical media? What's the release date and how much will it cost? Yeah, I think the last two questions are the, the biggest ones on everyone's mind. So from today, we now have more concrete information than ever before, thanks to the just streamed PS5 games event, um, which was postponed to respect the Black Lives Matter movement following the death of George Floyd. Somewhat surprisingly, given that the event itself was actually quite focused on the games more than the console itself, the console's design has been revealed already. And that's kind of a departure from previous launches, if mm. I'm not mistaken. Yep. And speaking of optical discs, uh, kind of, I guess this is in with the times, but now there are actually going to be two versions of the PlayStation 5. One that has a disc drive and a digital edition that has no disc drive. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean... They just need to tighten up the security for the PlayStation Network <laughs> for the digital edition, right? Um, so uh, like the already revealed DualSense controller, the PS5 consoles are exceptionally stylish, uh, writes Dan Sung and Tom Parsons of What Hi-Fi. In fact, we'd argue that this could be the most strikingly sculpted games machine ever created. For once, the myriad fanboy created concepts were too conservative. You know, the PS5, I mean, there's only one way to describe its design. It looks like a bro with his collar popped. It does, it does. <laughs> they, I mean, already the memes across Twitter are, you know, it's the, the collar is popped. <laughs> Yes, Parker, that's a very good description. So the PlayStation 5 has a black core surrounded by curved white edging and a blue glow. And the curved white edging kind of pushes out from the black core, giving it this collar like look. And people on Twitter are already very split as to whether they hate the look 
Other people on Twitter remarked that the console looked like a Wi-Fi router, so much that the term trended on Twitter shortly after the event. The event also revealed a number of new accessories, including a new wireless headset, a charging station in which you can dock two controllers at once, and an HD camera that mimics the look of the console itself. So you can have a little popped collar next to your big popped collar. And PlayStation can always be monitoring everything you're doing. Am I on mute? Never! <laughs> <laughs> so of course, with this being an event about games, we now know loads about the PS5 games lineup too. From an expanded and enhanced version of GTA V, yes, that's true, to yet another entry in Resident Evil franchise, and the hotly anticipated Horizon 2. Uh, there's loads to get excited about now. So Aaron, do you remember when the original release of GTA V was? You know, it was quite a while ago. I don't remember the exact 2013. Date. Oh my god, it was that long ago. And so, I mean, it really kind of blows my mind because literally, it's like almost, a, it's going to be an eight-year-old game when it comes out. And it, it's going <laughs> to come out, this re-release, which mm -hmm. is, you know, going to be better, stronger, faster, or whatever, mm -hmm. is scheduled to be autumn 2021. Wow, wow. <laughs> and so... Wait a second, so we actually don't know the actual launch date for the PS5 yet, but I'm sure it's going to be sometime in the somewhat near future, but why can't this eight-year-old game come out earlier than more than a year from now? I mean, what are they going to do? <laughs> I'm sh every GTA fan right now has uh, been asking this question and is asking it still. Yeah, they're, they're basically uh, going to the next uh, literally generation of people, right? Um, yeah, that's that's just a bit too long. Well, and also, I, I think the real question here, and I mean, I'm a big uh, GTA fan, so I'm kind of miffed at hearing this, but I think this also means that we're not going to see GTA 6 mm. before then. Oh, and no maybe way. maybe not for a while afterwards. No way, no way. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, wait, it's like uh, GTA and Daft Punk, two things, you just got to wait a really damn long time to get a new one. <laughs> <laughs> So, on the topic of release, according to the BBC, Sony's machine will launch alongside Microsoft's rival Xbox Series X before the end of this year. I mean, that pretty much tells you when it's going to come out. It's going to come out around Black Friday, basically, yep. because obviously both of these consoles are very squarely aiming for the American market, and everybody knows that Americans buy a bunch of video game consoles around the time that they're worthless kids start bugging them to buy them for them. So Laura Kate Dale, a freelance game critic, further comments, while there's a lot of unanswered questions about the PS5, namely price and release date, I think Sony did exactly what they needed to do with this reveal event. It's kind of funny because they, uh, I mean, it's a pretty video, but they didn't really do much of anything. Don't know how much it's going to cost, don't know when it's going to come out, just know that it likes to pop its collar and there's a bunch of games that are going to come out that have been out for half a decade. No, yeah, uh, <laughs> Parker, we, we, we watched the reveal video just uh, about an hour ago. The balls! Yeah. The balls! <laughs> it's these, uh, three Are they trying to tell us something? I mean... <laughs> these 3D animated, you know, blue and black balls. Uh, for like for almost like a minute right? yeah and it's like okay what then the balls start going up and down they like make a wave a wave of yeah. blue and back black balls <laughs> <laughs> yep yep all right so talking about price how much is this thing going to cost so the ps5 price wasn't revealed during the uh event um and it's likely to remain under wraps until closer to launch uh, if we look at other PlayStations, the original PlayStation and PS2 launched right at 299 USD. The PS3 started at 499, and the more recent PS4 came in around 399. It's widely believed that a price north of $400 is a receipt for trouble, but given the technological envelopes being pushed by the PS5, we wouldn't be surprised to see Sony take the risk. That was a blue ball. Don't come cheap, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know they have uh, the two different uh, PS5s, and then uh, in the in the promo video, 
there was um there was another clip that came after they showed the two and it had a bunch of accessories right as we mentioned yes yes I, that's got to be way way north of 400 probably six seven hundred dollar range i guess you know i wonder if there's going to be a new optical format because if there's an optical slot i mean you think they're still going to go with blu-ray i mean with you know 4k and 8k and all these k's you know mm-hmm. games of course are getting a lot larger so yep. i yep. wonder if they can even fit a ps5 game on a blu-ray anymore Good, good point, good point. The price of the PS5 will also be uh, impacted by the trade war going on now between China and America when it comes to manufacturing and shipping. Back in June 2019, Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft issued a joint statement warning of such price rises if the trade war continues. So already, uh, Bloomberg is saying that Sony is having troubles keeping the PS5's cost down due to components inside, such as DRAM and NAND flash memory. So this seems to suggest that the price of the PS5 is going to be higher instead of lower. Yep. So, you know, this issue with a uh, price for the PS5 is going to be a really big deterrent for an already huge user base of PS4 users. So um, on the software side, um, consumers have purchased about 1.15 billion games for the PS4 worldwide. Um, That comes as Sony touts 103 million monthly active users and 38.8 million PS Plus subscribers. So Sony already has a huge user base of PS4 consoles and games that they need to continue to support and it's going to be pretty tough to convince consumers to buy this new console if they can't uh, keep the price down. You know a lot of um, people in the game community too are focused on the fact that the PS4 is just now creating games that utilize its hardware to its full capacity. Um, Most recently with the Final Fantasy 7 remake I think that we're seeing uh, the PS4 at its greatest. So it's kind of a weird time, uh, in my opinion, to release a PS5. I know uh, it it makes sense uh, looking at their timeline from the 90s up until now, but um, really uh, I think Nintendo has a better approach right now in that they are maintaining with just the Switch and supporting that user base. And Sony would be pretty smart to follow in that same direction. At the same time though, I feel like Probably Sony's position is that they're trying to keep that wave and keep that momentum because I mean if we do know one thing about console wars is that things the tide can turn very quickly mm, that's and true. so I think if Sony were to you know get lazy and sit on their hand and just say oh I mean the PS4 is great so just keep playing that for a few more years you losers <laughs> uh, then I would I would imagine that you know Microsoft or Nintendo or both would use that as an opportunity to sneak up on them with something that would ruin their popularity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, and next up on Japanese politics, wow, we're going to cover how there's been great scrutiny over Tokyo Governor Koike's graduation credentials. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Japanese politics. Wow. Cairo University in Egypt has issued a statement acknowledging that Tokyo Governor Yuriko Koike graduated from the school in 1976, which is a outright denial of media reports that she had faked her academic credentials. And this is in response to a Shukan Bunshun tabloid article that came out a few days ago that accused uh, Koike of not actually having graduated from Cairo University and submitting a fake diploma as supposed proof of her graduation. And so this is actually related to a new book that just came out on the subject and also there was a press conference at the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan just a few days ago by some legal experts who seem to support this claim that her academic credentials are not proper. Wow, wow, wow. So what's the basis for this? Do you think this is a smear campaign? Most definitely. And so 
obviously, you know, it's 1976, so I don't know what kind of records keeping Cairo University had in 1976 or, you know, how fancy or fake proof their diplomas were, but Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously that sort of an old record they don't really have, you know, some kind of database or mainframe. Probably, I mean, it's probably just some paper record somewhere. So, for sure, for sure. I mean, even hearing uh, that a Japanese national went to Egypt for school is pretty rare in and of itself, right? So Definitely. I can imagine the public, <laughs> yes, not believing it or being well. It. And it's actually so that's actually a big problem because personally, I think that Governor Koike did graduate from Cairo University, Mm -hmm. and I do think that this is a smear campaign. Obviously, I'm not a professional diploma checker, nor have I seen the actual diploma, so, I mean, this is just my opinion, but obviously the timing is very suspicious because Koike is right about to announce and just actually has announced her intention to run for re-election where she is widely seen as a shoo-in as both the LDP and Komeito have said that they are not going to run an opposing candidate. Mm, okay. And okay. so other than opposition parties who, I mean, I think the CDP and the Japan Communist Party have said they're going to run Kenji Utsunomiya who's the same guy who they ran last time. And guess what? He lost. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) they're going to run him again against the pretty popular incumbent. So, I Mm. mean, we can only guess he's going to lose again. And they picked him based on the likely situation that he's going to lose. And I think there's, uh, what is it? Uh, Takafume Horie, the kind of famous bad boy entrepreneur, is going to run. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, that crazy anti-NHK guy is going to run too, Tachibana, mm. who uh, was funny until he turned out to be a certified racist, and so now I don't like him very much. <laughs> but really, I mean, you know, Governor Koike is the only credible candidate for this governorship. And oh, yeah. to be honest with you, I mean, if you remember, do you remember any of our past governors of Tokyo? Not they were all crap. Right, right. You know, uh, we had, you know, Mr. Uh, I'm a big fat racist, Ishihara. Right, right. And, I mean, he was a governor for, I think, over a decade. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Koike has been building up so much momentum, too, during the whole pandemic. Uh, We see her on TV, on YouTube, uh, every day, every night. She's doing lots of outreach, uh, really community-based outreach. Yes, making yes. Sure well, every- I mean, people have even said, and there have been articles suggesting that her response to the pandemic has been even better than the prime minister's. So, Absolutely. Yeah, as a resident of Tokyo, I mean, for sure, uh, as a foreign resident of Tokyo. So, of course, this allegation... From the start, the timing of it makes it look very suspicious, and the statement from Cairo University really harshly criticized such claims, saying that such behavior seriously damages the honor of Cairo University and Cairo University graduates and cannot be overlooked. The statement also said that the university is considering appropriate measures based on the laws of Egypt. Wow. So they're going to crush them with a big fat pyramid. (laughs) You know, we, we know Koike speaks like really good English. She does lots of uh, broadcasts. And she's English. also fluent in Arabic. And I was just about yeah. to ask, yeah. Okay. And so her Arabic is very good. I mean, obviously, you know, she graduated in 1976, which last time I checked was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, also, I actually studied a little bit of Arabic in university here in Japan, but. Oh, wow. As you might imagine, studying Arabic and Japanese was not easy for, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, many for sure. reasons, so I'm not very good at it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, I have seen uh, well-known uh, interpreters and translators on Twitter actually coming to Koike's defense, saying that you know anybody who's heard her speak mm. or heard her interact with various ambassadors and diplomats in Arabic Mm. know that her ability is very good yeah my only com- my only comment is get her into power i mean uh the more people we can have that have a good communications and linguistic background i mean uh we need a little bit more of that in the u.s as well i'd say <laughs> <You know? laughs> i think it's too late to see if she might 
switch teams and you know run for office in America. Yeah. <laughs> that would be funny. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. We want your feedback, comments, and ideas. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We will listen to your ideas, and we might even try something new. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave. Tokyo Wave.